The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Chapter 15, Deeper Magic from Before the Dawn of Time. While the two girls still crouched in the bushes with their hands over their faces, they heard the voice of the witch calling out, Now, follow me all, and we will set about what remains of this war. It will not take us long to crush the human vermin and the traitors now that the great fool, the great cat, lies dead. At this moment, the children were for a few seconds in very great danger. For with wild cries and a noise of skirling pipes and shrill horns blowing, the whole of that vile rabble came sweeping off the hilltop and down the slope right past their hiding place. They felt the specters go by them like a cold wind, and they felt the ground shake beneath them under the galloping feet of the minotaurs, and overhead there went a flurry of foul wings and a blackness of vultures and giant bats. At any other time, they would have trembled with fear, but now the sadness and shame of, and horror of Aslan's death so filled their minds that they hardly thought of it. As soon as the wood was silent again, Susan and Lucy crept out onto the open hilltop. The moon was getting low and thin clouds were passing across her, but still they could see the shape of the lion lying dead in his bonds. And down they both knelt in the wet grass and kissed his cold face and stroked his beautiful fur, what was left of it, and cried until they thought they could cry no more. And then they looked at each other and held each other's hands for mere loneliness and cried again and then again were silent. At last, Lucy said, I can't bear to look at that horrible muzzle. I wonder, could we take it off? And so they tried. After a lot of working at it, for their fingers were cold and it was now the darkest part of the night, they succeeded. And when they saw his face without it, they burst out crying again and kissed it and fondled it and wiped away the blood and the foam as well as they could. And it was all more lonely and hopeless and horrid I, than I know how to describe. I wonder, could we untie him as well, said Susan presently? But the enemies, out of pure spitefulness, had drawn the cords so tight that the girls could make nothing of the knots. I hope no one who reads this book has been quite as miserable as Susan and Lucy were that night. But if you have been, if you've been up all night and cried till you have no more tears left in you, you will know that there comes in the end a sort of quietness. You feel as if nothing is ever going to happen again. At any rate, that was how it felt to these two. Hours and hours seemed to go by in this dead calm, and they hardly noticed that they were getting colder and colder. But at last, Lucy noticed two things. One was the sky on the east side of the hill was a little less dark than it had been an hour ago. The other was some tiny movement going on in the grass around her feet. At first, she took no notice of this. What did it, what did it matter? Nothing mattered now. But at last, she saw that whatever it was had begun to move up the upright stones of the stone table. And now, whatever they were, were moving about on Aslan's body. She peered closer. They were little gray things. Ah, said Susan from the other side of the table. How beastly. There are horrid little mice crawling over him. Go away, you little beasts. And she raised her hand to frighten them away. Wait, said Lucy, who had been looking at them more closely still. Can you see what they're doing? Both girls bent down and stared. I do believe, said Susan. But how queer. They're nibbling away at the cords. That's what I thought, said Lucy. I think they're friendly mice. Poor little things, they don't realize he's dead. They think it'll do some good untying him. It was quite definitely lighter by now. Each of the girls noticed for the first time the white face of the other. They could see the mice nibbling away, dozens and dozens, even hundreds of little field mice. And at last, one by one, the ropes were all gnawed through. The sky in the east was whitish by now, and the stars were getting fainter, all except one very big, one very low down on the eastern horizon. They felt colder than they had been all night. The mice crept away again. The girls cleared away the, remnant, the remains of the gnawed ropes. 
Aslan looked more like himself without them. Every moment his dead face looked nobler as the light grew and they could see it better. In the wood behind them, a bird gave a chuckling sound. It had been so still for hours and hours that it startled them. Then another bird answered it. Soon there were birds singing all over the place. It was quite definitely early morning now, not late night. I'm so cold, said Lucy. So am I, said Lu Susan. Let's walk about a bit. They walked to the eastern edge of the hill and looked down. The one big star had almost disappeared. The country all looked dark gray, but beyond, at the very end of the world, the sea shone pale. The sky began to turn red. They walked to and fro, more times than they could count, between the dead Aslan and the eastern ridge, trying to keep warm, and oh, how tired their legs felt. Then at last, as they stood for a moment looking out toward the sea and Car Paravel, which they could now just make out, the red turned to gold along the line where the sea and the sky met, and very slowly up came the edge of the sun. At that moment, they heard from behind them a loud noise, a great cracking, deafening noise, as if a giant had broken a giant's plate. What's that? said Lucy, clutching Susan's arm. I, I feel afraid to turn around, said Susan. Something awful is happening. They're doing something worse to him, said Lucy. Come on, and she turned, pulling Susan around with her. The rising of the sun had made everything look so different. All colors and, sh and shadows were changed that for a moment they didn't see the important thing. Then they did. The stone table was broken into two pieces by a great crack that ran, ran down it from one end to another, and there was no Aslan. Oh, 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 cried the two girls, rushing back from the table. Oh, it's too bad, sobbed Lucy. We might have left, they might have left the body alone who did this? cried Susan. What does it mean? Is it more magic? Yes, said a great voice behind their backs. It is more magic. And they looked around and there, shining in the sunrise, larger than they had seen him before, shaking his mane, for it had apparently grown again, stood Aslan himself. Oh, Aslan, cried both the children, staring up at him, almost as much frightened as they were glad. Aren't you dead then, dear Aslan, said Lucy? Well, not now, said Aslan. You're not, not a, asked Susan in a shaky voice. She couldn't bring herself to say the word ghost. Aslan stooped his golden head and licked his, her forehead. The warmth of his breath and the rich sort of smell that seemed to hang about his hair came all over her. Do I look it, he said. You're real, oh, you're real. Oh, Aslan, cried Lucy and both girls flung themselves upon him and covered him with kisses. But what does it all mean? asked Susan when they were somewhat calmer. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, there's a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge only goes back to the dawn of time, but if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backward. And now, oh yes, now, said Lucy, jumping up and clapping her hands. Oh children, said the lion, I feel my strength coming back to me. Oh children, catch me if you can. He stood for a second his eyes very bright, his limbs quivering, lashing himself with his tail. And then he made a leap high over their heads and landed on the other side of the table. Laughing, though she didn't know why, Lucy scrambled over to reach him. Aslan leaped again. A mad chase began. Round and round the hilltop he led them, now hopelessly out of their reach, now letting them almost catch his tail now diving between them, now tossing them in the air with his huge and beautiful velvety paws and catching them again, and now stopping unexpectedly so that all three of them rolled over together in a happy laughing heap of fur and arms and legs. It was such a romp as no one has ever had except in Narnia, and whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm 
or playing with a kitten, Lucy could never make up her mind. And the funny thing was that when all three finally lay together panting in the sun, the girls no longer felt in the least tired or hungry or thirsty. And now, said Aslan presently, to business. I feel I am going to roar. You'd better put your fingers in your ears. And they did. And Aslan stood up, and when he opened his mouth to roar, his face became so terrible that they did not dare to look at it. And they saw all the trees in front of him bend before the blast of his roaring, as, grasses bends, as grass bends in a meadow before the wind. And then he said, <clears throat> we have a long journey to go. You must ride on me. And he crouched down and the children climbed onto his warm golden back. And Susan sat first, holding on tightly to his mane. And La Lucy sat behind, holding on tightly to Susan. And with a great heave, he rose underneath them and then shot off faster than any horse could go downhill and into the thick of the forest. That ride was perhaps the most wonderful thing that happened to them in Narnia. Have you ever had a gallop on a horse? Think of that and then take away the heavy noise of the hooves and the jingle of the bits and imagine instead the almost noiseless padding of great paws and then imagine instead of the black or gray or chestnut back of a horse, the soft roughness of golden fur and the mane flying back in the wind. And then imagine you're going about twice as fast as the fastest racehorse. But this is a, a mount that doesn't need to be guided and never grows tired. He rushes on and on, never missing his footing, never hesitating, threading his way with perfect skill between tree trunks, jumping over bush and briar and the smaller streams, wading the larger, swimming the largest of all, and you are riding not on a road, nor in a park, nor even on the downs, but right across Narnia in spring, down solemn avenues of beach and across sunny glades of oak, through wild orchards of snow white cherry trees, past roaring waterfalls and mossy rocks and echoing caverns up windy slopes, a light with gorse bushes and across the shoulders of heathery mountains and along giddy ridges and down, down, down again into wild valleys and out onto acres of blue flowers. It was nearly midday when they found themselves looking down a steep hillside at a castle, a little toy castle it looked from where they stood, which seemed to be all pointed towers, but the line was rushing down at such a speed that it grew larger every moment. And before they had time even to ask themselves, what is it they were, all, what is it? They were already on a level with it. And now it no longer looked like a toy castle, but rose frowning in front of them. No face looked over the battlements and the gates were fast shut. And Aslan, not at all slacking his pace, rushed straight as a bullet toward it. The witch is home, he cried. Now children, hold tight. Next moment, the whole world seemed to turn upside down and the children felt as if they had left their insides behind them, for the lion had gathered himself together for a greater leap than any he had yet made and jumped, or you may call it flying, rather than jumping, right over the castle wall. The two girls, breathless but unhurt, found themselves tumbling off his back in the middle of a wide stone courtyard full of statues. All right, the end. <laughs>